Good morning. Today's passage is Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 29. Romans 9, 19 through 29. Let's read the word of God together. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there will be, they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites will be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. You know, in chapter 9, uh, the previous verses, uh, Paul refers to the time of Israel, uh, history, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, despite plagues that were sent by God against Egypt, Pharaoh repeatedly, one of the phrases that we see when we read this account is that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. If God is the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he continues to continue to say no to Moses, the question then comes, and that's what verse 19 really speaks about here, is the question that comes is, is it fair to judge him? How can God find fault with Pharaoh when God is the one who actually caused the hard heart? If God is causing the hard heart, it how is God punishing? How can God punish Pharaoh for actions that he actually cannot control? Actions that he cannot avoid. Pharaoh was merely an instrument in God's hands. How can it be his fault? Paul knows naturally that these are some of the questions that will arise as he talks about uh, this topic. Paul imagines that people are asking, if, okay, if, all, if it's all a matter of God's choice, then how can God find fault with me? How can God find fault for my sins? And I think this is a normal human reaction because we are looking at it from a human perspective. Our passage today really answers this question. Paul points to the sovereignty of God. What we discover about the sovereignty of God is this, that God answers to no one. We question God, but you know, God answers to no one. Look at verse 20. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? So Paul begins to turn the tables here a little bit and he begins to ask the questions. Who are we mere humans to question God? God is the one who molded Adam from the dust of the ground. God is the one who formed us in the mother's womb. Can the one who was molded talk back to the one who, mo who molded? Is it right for the one who was created to question the creator? Asking, why did you make me this way? The answer this, to these questions is, is no. Created things don't talk back to their maker. We answer to someone. Always. We always are answering to someone. In school, we have a teacher. We answer to the teacher. At work, we have a boss or a manager that we answer to. On a sports team, we have a coach that we answer to. At home, we have parents that we answer to. We can't always do what we want to do. Why? Because we always have to answer, or we are always answering to someone else. But you see, God answers to no one because He is God. Because He is God, He can do whatever He wants. 
And this is a hard pill to swallow. Who are we to question the rightness of God? We're not equipped to challenge God. And yet, oftentimes, we find ourselves doing that. You know, in the story of Job, uh, we see that Job did nothing wrong. Uh, as, as the book of Job opens, Satan is the one who comes. And he challenges God. He's like, yeah, Job, I mean, you've done all. He is the way he is because you have protect, protected him. You have provided all of that. Take that away from him. He'll curse you. So there was this little challenge by Satan to God. But God showed utmost confidence in Job. Job never blames God, but he does say it doesn't seem fair. That what he's experienced or what he has experienced doesn't seem right. Contrary to his friends who say, you know, confess. It's your sin that has brought about the suffering. But God responds to Job with some questions. Uh, I think beginning in chapter 38 through about 40, 41, there's a series of questions God has for Job. And some of the questions are this. Where were you laid when I laid the foundations of the earth? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Can you order the course of the stars? Can you tame or control the behemoth or the Leviathan? Job just says, you know what? I, I can't. I spoke of the things that I did not understand. And he repents. The ways of God are beyond our understanding. Job wanted to question God and he sought answers. He felt God owed him at least that because he was confident that he did nothing wrong. Job discovered that God doesn't owe us anything. God really puts him in his place. We far too often operate, I think, with this mindset. We have developed the sense that, that God owes us something. That God is obligated to us in some way or some form. Where did the sense of entitlement come from? Entitlement is a false belief that you have a right to something. That you are inherently deserving of something. And I think that's what Paul is talking about here. There's something inside that leads us to think that we have a right to something. Right to answers from God. We demand to, to know why we are suffering. We feel like we are deserving of answers. We question God when things are, they, they just don't make sense. Or we wonder where God's presence has gone when we encounter suffering or hardship. And we question whether or not God still loves us. We feel that we are entitled to answers. We think God owes us, or God owes me an explanation. I served Him faithfully, and now I am struck with this disease. I served Him faithfully, but I've lost everything. I need, an, I need an explanation from God. This is only, this can only happen from creator to created and never the other way. We have seen people with a sense of entitlement act rudely, judge, and mistreat others. You know, they make outrageous demands and never believe that they are in the wrong. And to enhance Paul's point, he says in verse 21, Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use. Doesn't the potter have the right to do whatever he wants with the clay? Nobody tells the potter what to do with his clay. The potter exercises his sovereignty and nobody questions him. Yet, why do we question God's sovereignty? God is free to choose what he does whenever he wants to whomever he chooses. It is his right as God. We cannot question it. God chose to love us. Do we deserve it? Absolutely not. God is faithful to us even though we are unfaithful to Him. Does He take away or withhold His love? No. If others did that, if we experienced that, wouldn't we consider it to be unfair? Wouldn't we question the person's loyalty, friendship? Wouldn't we feel like we are being taken advantage of? Wouldn't we question the faithfulness and give them a limited, finite chances. You know what? I would just give you a few more chances or maybe just one more chance. God's love, mercy is something absolutely and completely unearned and undeserved. You know, one pastor writes this. We can't appreciate the depth of that kind of love until we accept the fact that it's entirely unnecessary on God's part. 
Paul's larger point would be that though God is loving, kind, and just, He does not owe anything to any human person. Everything He gives to us is a gift of grace. If God owes some people or any people His mercy, then it would remove the element of grace. It's freely given to us. The sovereignty of God. Because God is sovereign, He chose, He chooses to bestow upon us love, mercy. And God has the sovereign right to do anything He wants with His own creation. Thank God for this undeserved grace and mercy. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for love and grace that is undeserved, unwarranted. And you, yet you choose to freely give us for that we are thankful. Yes, all things are in your control. And there are things that happen that we do not understand. But we, may we never question. May we never question. Even though it doesn't make sense. May we never question, may we never doubt you. Because you are a sovereign God. And you can do whatever you want. Give us the faith to understand. Faith to receive. Faith to believe. But more than anything, for the love and mercy that you have given to us, may we be grateful. In Jesus' name we pray.